Space Rocks. Hello and welcome to Space Rocks. In this video we're going to take a brief look at some historical space settlement designs, what they look like from the outside, the inside, and a little bit about how they operate. Uh, towards the end we might also look at some newer ideas and where things are going. So this is the classic O'Neill cylinder. These things could be up to four kilometers in radius and they use extremely large mirrors to reflect sunlight through large windows down onto valleys below. If it's not quite clear how these work at this angle, we'll look at some other pictures here in a sec. Before that, though, I wanted to go over some of the basic designs suggested at the 1975 NASA Summer Study. Um, I don't think we're going to look at dumbbells or the beaded toruses, but torus, sphere, banded torus, and cylinder are a number of the ones that we'll be looking at here. So back to Gerard O'Neill's design. Uh, you can kind of see uh, Valley 1, 2, and 3 have the thicker lines, and that's where people would be living. And each valley has directly above it a large window, and that's where the sunlight comes in, thanks to the mirrors. Another section view of an O'Neill cylinder, this time from the side at one of the end caps. Uh, this one shows how you could build mountains on the end cap. Uh, it might be kind of strange to hike up these, though, because the closer you got to the top, towards the center axis of rotation, uh, you would get lower and lower gravity. And so hopefully this starts to make a little bit more sense as we look at the inside of a cylinder. You can see the mirrors outside and the sunlight being reflected to the inside through those massive windows. So here's kind of a cool image I haven't seen until recently. Um, this one apparently comes from a science magazine from Russia during the 70s. One of the cool things you get about this is the sort of sense of scale you get with the cutaway, being able to see the inside and the outside at the same time but also you get to see the profile of the mountains on the end cap that we were seeing earlier. So next up is a Bernal sphere. Um, you can kind of see the rectangular mirrors around the outside. Those are primary mirrors reflecting sunlight to those uh, conical ones on either end of the sphere, um, which brings the sunlight on the inside. And then on either end you see the banded toruses that we were looking at earlier. And with this design that's where the farms are located. Now here on the inside you can see it's a little chaotic with neighborhoods stretching all the way up and over your head. But in the back you see the ring of light and that's where the sunlight was coming in um, that we saw on the mirrors from the outside. And here is a Stanford torus. Uh, the weird looking thing on the top is actually just a large uh, disc shaped mirror at an angle. And so that reflects sunlight from the, the sun down onto the sort of cone shaped mirror in the center which then bounces that to the ceiling you see on the ring. And hopefully this makes it uh, make a little more sense. Um, you can see the ceiling of the habitat here, and they're installing, uh, the caption calls them chevron shields. And what these do is they allow the sunlight to bounce its way through those mirrors down through the glass and into the colony, uh, while the thickness of the, uh, the chevron shields themselves stops harmful radiation. And here is a view from the inside. Uh, I think there's color images of this you can find online, but this black and white one I just pulled out of a old book that I have. And here's another image of a Stanford torus um, with the radiation shielding on the outside. It's not super realistic. If you're just a pile of rocks like that on the outside and then spin this thing, it would all fly off if you weren't holding them down somehow but it does kind of highlight one of the major problems that a lot of these older designs have. The large majority of the mass of these space stations is radiation shielding, and most of that is supposed to come from the moon or asteroids. But to source that material would require a very well-developed logistical infrastructure between the moon, Earth orbit, asteroids, and the surface of the Earth itself. And that's something we don't currently have right now. And so a lot of these designs, while they look super interesting, um, they're too far away to be realistically looking at them right now. Even though in 1975, NASA did determine we essentially have all of the technology and engineering and physics understanding to build them today, uh, what we don't have is a lot of the tools and logistical infrastructure to build anything of this scale. So where do we go from here? There seems to be a large gap between the sort of tin can space stations that we've had a temporary presence on, such as the International Space Station, uh, and the sort of 
settlements that can house thousands to millions of people over the course of their entire lives. Well, there have been some newer ideas in recent years, uh, such as Al Globus suggested that we build the initial settlements in low Earth equatorial orbit. Now, a neat thing about that location is, say, you're at the level of the International Space Station or a little bit higher, but you keep your orbit above the equator where you retain the majority of the benefit of the radiation from Earth's magnetosphere. By doing that, you greatly reduce the amount of material you need to build your space station, and now it becomes possible to launch the whole thing from the Earth. You no longer need to go to the moon or capture a near-Earth asteroid to get the majority of your building materials for your settlement. And so I think that's where things start to get interesting. What is the next stepping stone after ISS, after Artemis? What can we do between where we are and where we want to be, if, if where we want to be is those massive settlements, what is the next thing that we can do? Well, another suggestion from Globus is Kaplana 1, a space station in low Earth equatorial orbit that houses about 3,000 people. Now, I still think 3,000 people is still a rather large undertaking, and building something like that in a modular fashion that can be bolted together sort of the way the ISS was may be a little bit unrealistic. I think a good step is a workshop, a place where you can permanently house a group of people that are going to assemble the next largest structure in space, whether it's a solar power satellite or a large habitat like Kaplana 1, or say the infrastructure on the moon to mine materials there for the benefit of Earth or for the construction of other projects in space. I think that a work camp like that, housing maybe a dozen to max probably like around a hundred people would be a reasonable baby step from where we're presently at. So here's a concept I've been playing with. Admittedly, this is more of an art project than it is a serious submission to space settlement designs. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about uh, inflatable and collapsible technology, which I think is really the, the next best stepping stone we have between tin can construction uh, that fits on a rocket and the sort of large structures that we will be building out of materials that we find in space. So here it is with the microgravity section removed. Uh, you can see the inflatable modular sections. Uh, this actually kind of resembles the beaded torus we saw at the beginning. Um, and the inflatable sections resemble sort of like one of those inflated like soccer tents you can see sometimes. Um, or say uh, Sierra Nevada's life habitat just kind of squashed down onto a surface, so you have a sort of flat floor. Uh, that belt would be like a rolled fabric structure, a Kevlar or something, um, probably with some stiffen some bracing or stiffeners uh, to keep its shape if it's not spinning. And like O'Neill's designs, there's a pair of them gang together, counter-rotating to eliminate any gyroscopic uh, effects. Then here's a close-up with the airlock on the kind of dark side, get a sense of scale. Ultimately, I thought that this was a bit too large. So uh, here's just a screenshot out of Blender of a smaller version. Um, you can see uh, the inflatable sections are a little bit more squat. Uh, they're probably restrained with like cables uh, from the ceiling to the floor to keep them from ballooning out too much, which should help to maximize floor space on one level. I figure if you're going to have artificial gravity, you might as well keep it single level to begin with minimize risk of dropping things, falling down stairs, injuries, that sort of thing. Then here's a close-up of one of the sections showing how they're sort of joined together. Um, another one of the flaws that we had with a lot of the designs we saw in the 70s is that they mostly relied on the space shuttle actually being a cheap reusable vehicle, and it was not inexpensive. Um, other people can tell you about that. I'm not going to go into it but it looks like today we may have on the horizon some actual inexpensive reusable vehicles that can lift a lot of mass and do it over and over and over again. So with a vehicle like that, you might be able to send up, say, one of these inflatable sections, um, a couple airlocks, maybe a rolled up bit of that belt material, and start building it up piece by piece in an affordable fashion. So maybe the first space settlements might look like a fuel farm in a centrifuge, or they might look like Babylon 5, or they might not look like anything that we've looked at here. But whatever they end up being, I'll bet it's going to be cool. Thanks for watching.